and we thank you and praise you. We give you glory, honor, and worship, oh God, because you are so deserving this morning. You are high, you are lifted up. Your train fills the temple, oh God. Father God, this little planet that we live on is just a little speck in the galaxy. And this morning, you are the God of wonders beyond the galaxy. And so this morning, you are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy to open the book, Jesus. You are worthy to break the seals this morning. The Lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Thank you, O God. Father, choose the hymns, the scriptures, everything that we are to do. Bless the pastors, O God, this morning. Pastor Wilfred, Pastor Police, Pastor Brown. Oh God, your officers this morning, your children this morning. Oh God, bless, oh God, bless and keep. Father, oh God, as our praises go up, let the blessings come down. Oh, because your children, we are depending on you. Have mercy this morning, God. Oh, Father God, forgive us of our trespasses. Oh God, the little sins that easily beset us. Help us to forgive. Help us to love. Oh God, help us to give up our rights for His sake this morning, oh God, because only the pure in heart shall see God. What have I failed to ask of you? I do not grant it, I pray. For we ask these verses in no other name but the mighty and precious name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, Forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise, Praise the name of the Praise Lord. We shall continue by singing hymn 42. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of Lords. Praise God. All hail the power of Jesus.
name of the Lord. Praise God. We shall read for our morning's lesson. Second Chronicles chapter 22. We're going to read from verse 1 to the end, which is verse 12. We shall read the last verse together. We will read it alternately. Praise the name of the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 22. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise you. <clears throat> and the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his stead. For the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the elders. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Pastor Will, Pastor Police, Pastor Brown in the absence. 
are deacons, evangelists, you sweet saints in God's house. This morning I greet you in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God for another day in his house. And so this morning, I just want to leave you with an encouragement because the word of God teaches us that God will preserve and do what he will. And over the years, they tried to kill the royal seed. But we, today, we have Jesus. We have salvation. And no matter what had happened, God will preserve. So this morning, let us fear not. COVID-19 or no COVID-19, God will preserve whom he will so that his purpose will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. In prayer, my strength in the Lord as I turn the service into the hands of pastor police to do as the Lord.
I believe. Praise God. Jesus. I believe Jesus. I believe him. He is God. Hallelujah. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's just so worthy. So we pray. Somebody said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, that's all that he has done for me. My soul. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. For saving me. You see, you don't know like I know. What he has done for me. You don't know the battles. You don't know the challenges. Somebody said, I'm coming up. Rough side of the mountain. Oh, but by God's grace, we're going to make it here. Hallelujah. Some of the troubles sometimes are here. Filling men's hearts with fear. The freedom we all hold in. No is at stake. Oh, but Jesus is coming soon. Morning. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. He's worthy to be praised. Praise God. You may be seated. We thank God. Come on, put your hands together for the praise team. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You see, as Emmanuel, we come to our church. We come to praise God. Amen. And we praise him not just for what he's done, but we praise him for who he is. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the first and he is the last. He says, I am he that was dead. I am alive. And I am alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Not just that, but he has the key. He has the key of death. And he has the key of hell. That means my God is in control. Are you with me? He's in control. Amen. And because he's in control, I don't have to worry. Because I'm on the Lord's side. And if you're on the Lord's side, you are more than conquering through Jesus Christ. Come on and give God a break. Come on, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. This morning, I'm going to take a word this morning from the book of Romans, chapter 12. We did it. We did a part of it last time, and I promised you I would, we would try to take it home this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 12, and I'm just going to read you a few verses. Romans chapter 12 from verse 1. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Verse 6 and last, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, but a prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of this holy word. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your house, Lord God. We thank you for your children. We thank you that you have sent your spirit to abide with us. This morning as we come, my God, we acknowledge our state of unworthiness. But Father, in the same breath, we just exalt your holy name because you are the faithful God. You love us, Lord God, when we were not lovable. Now that we are your children, we pray that you would embrace us and allow us, by God, to live for you the way we ought to live, because you are the Holy God. We pray for clarity in your word, we pray for understanding, we pray for wisdom, we pray, my God, that your word will accomplish its purpose in our hearts today. 
in the name of Jesus. As for me, Lord, so unworthy. But I lean on you because you are my God. You are the source of my strength, and I give you praise. Transform hearts today. Save souls for your kingdom. Lord, let your name be exalted in all this and done. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Praise God. Let me greet, let me take this opportunity to greet the household of faith this morning, our pastors, praise God, and our officers, and our visiting friends. I accept holy greetings this morning in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. This morning we thank God for another day in the land of the living. When we think about where we could have been, where we are, we give God thanks. Not because we are so good, but because God is faithful. And I thank Him this morning for being so merciful. Psalm um, says He's slow to anger, and He is plenteous in mercy. So, as we get into the Word this morning, I want to talk to us again briefly as the Spirit of God leads. I'm talking about renewing the mind. Renewing the mind. Renewing the mind. And the mind has to be renewed. Now, the Apostle Paul, and we talked the last time about there are three, there were there, there are three things that he mentioned. He mentioned the body, he mentioned the uh, the mind, and he mentioned the spirit. Amen. He said, present your bodies. And then he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. So there is body, there is mind, and there is will. Last time we spoke about the soul, because in order for the body to be presented to God, the soul has to be right. The soul first has to be saved. And, and, and Paul says, because of the mercies of God, the soul is saved. The soul receives salvation. And salvation is deliverance from evil. Salvation is deliverance from death. Salvation is deliverance from the eternal punishment, which is the lake of fire. Amen. And so because of salvation, because we are saved, and because not we are saved, we can present our body. You see, the Bible tells us that we are a royal priesthood. God took a lump of clay, injected his love and his grace and his mercy, and that lump of clay has now become priest, royal priesthood. The Bible says we are a holy nation, and we are able to offer up to God spiritual sacrifice. And because of that, God expects us to present ourselves. And so we talked about the mercy that God has given to us. We talked about love. We talked about grace. We talked about joy. Yes. Patience. And we talked about the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a part of that package. That which, 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 with regards to the mercies of God. And so because God has given us these mercies. And now that we are saved. He's saying present your body. Now when he says present your body, he's not just talking about the physical or the material part, which has to do your hands and your feet, but he's talking about the parts that are immaterial that has to do with your thoughts. So your thinking has to be centered on God. Amen. Bible says we should, we should keep our minds or we should focus our minds on things above. Yes. Amen? Amen? And so he's talking about our desires, our thinking, our desires. Yes, the places, the, 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 our, our source of entertainment has to be centered on God. Because whatever entertains us will move us. And whatever moves us will control us. And it will control our actions. And so Paul is saying that we have to present our bodies. Now, is this, is this real? Yes. Is this practical? Yes. Because God has given us what it takes to be who he wants us to be. 
And he's saying, compared to all the things that I've given you, all I require of you is your body, soul, and spirit. Now, in the book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 12, Romans 6 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul is, is giving us a practical application. And now we're going to talk about presenting our bodies. Amen? So we dealt with the soul, and now we're going to talk about the body. And Paul is saying in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, Let not therefore, let's not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Amen? When something reigns, or someone reigns, they have supreme rule. Yeah? And that means they control you. And so he's writing to the church and he's saying, do not allow sin to reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Now, because you are saved doesn't mean that the desires are saved. Oh. There are desires that will arise in the human body. But because we are saved, now, the interesting thing is, we have to understand that we don't live this Christian life to be saved. We live this Christian life because we are saved. Jesus expects the church to be set apart from the world because the church has the Spirit of God. And because we have the Spirit of God, then we will be able to do what God has called us to do. You see, if we could do, live this life on our own, we would not need Jesus. Amen. But because we are incapable of changing our own selves, then we rely on God. Amen. And then when God saves us, He fills us with His Spirit, and now He empowers us to live the Christian life. Amen. And so He said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. The next verse. He said, neither yield ye your members. Now, your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Your members, that takes into account your hands, your feet, your speech. Amen. Amen. And so, the parts of your body, we have to now yield. He says, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And so now we're presenting our body, we're giving God our all. And, 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 and Paul is saying that this is now our reasonable service. Yes? The next verse, it says, For sin, shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not, shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not control you anymore. For you are not under the law, but you are under what? Grace. grace. And grace is help. Grace is help. Grace is help to overcome the tests and the trials. Grace is help to deal with all the things that life throws in our direction. And I want you to know that as believers, there are things that will happen to us that sometimes will seem unseemly, but God has given us the grace to overcome. He says where grace is needed, grace is given. Yes? And so because grace is given, we need to now apply that grace. And I want you to know that when the Bible says we are sin abound, grace did much more abound. So there is no lack or shortage of grace. Wherever, whatever we need, grace is available. Amen. Verse 19 of Romans chapter 6, we're going to jump down to the 19th verse. The Apostle Paul says, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness. And what he's saying is, you, 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 we used to yield ourselves to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, 
even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and so he's comparing the way we were before we got saved and so he's saying look at the way we were before we got saved he says now do the opposite Amen. we used to yield ourselves to satisfy the desires of ourselves now he's saying surrender yourself to god and allow god to be glorified allow god to receive the honor that he deserves and this is very practical now you will find people who will tell you that they are very spiritual and i've met a few they're very spiritual and I'm saying, okay, you are spiritual in your thinking. Yeah. But what about your actions? Yeah. Because your actions have to correlate to your thinking. Yeah. In other words, you cannot say you're a Christian and then you don't live like a Christian. Yeah. But your body is yielded to uncleanness or unrighteousness. And, 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 and there's a practical there's a practical implication. In other words, what Paul is saying here is in order for God to use you, you have to be yielded to God. In order for God to fill you up and for God to put his gifts in you and for the gifts to operate properly in the church, you have to yield yourself to God. God has to have control over your life. God has to have control over your marriage, over your finances, over every aspect of your life, because this is how we present ourselves to God. Are you with me? We look at Abraham and we look at Isaac. And Abraham went on Mount Moriah to offer Isaac. Isaac would have been a dead sacrifice. But to Abraham, he was a living sacrifice. And when you look at what Isaac represented, Isaac represented Abraham's ear. He was the one that was going to carry on his name. Abraham waited for Isaac for over 25 years. And now God is saying, kill the boy. But you look at the level of commitment that God had to Abraham, that he was willing to bring the lad up to Mount Moriah, knowing what the lad represented but he was willing to give him back to god because god hallelujah god deserves our best not only does he deserve our best but he deserves our all and so paul is saying as believers as the church in order for god to fully manifest himself in us through us and around us we have to submit our all to him we have to be willing to give him our all. And so this is where we get the word sanctification. Because you are sanctified when you give God your all. Amen. Now sanctification is not an immediate action, but sanctification is a process. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Look with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 4. And let's hear what the writer is saying. Because, you see, we are living in what we now know as the 21st century. And it would seem as if there's a new breed of Christianity around. But I want you to know that the all-time religion, it was good for Paul and Silas, it's good enough for me. And one of the things I know about Jesus is, he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Paul says, and let's jump to the third verse so we can, we can get a good, a good springboard. He says, for well, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So that was one issue that was in the church. Amen? Amen. I don't think in this church. But he said in the next verse, he said, he said that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. What is your vessel? Your vessel is your body. So he's saying as believers, we ought to know how to possess, how to handle, how to take control of our bodies. Because our body is special to God. He says, know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. 
The next verse, not in the lust of concupiscence, <clears throat> even as the Gentiles which know not God. So now he's saying, this is our comparison. We don't live like the world. We don't live like the world lives, but we live, we are called to a higher order. Yes? With greater authority comes greater responsibility. So now that you have the Spirit of God, God expects you to live differently. He expects you to behave differently. The ways that you used to behave before you got saved is supposed to be things of the past. He says, if any man in Christ, he will be a new creature. He's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So he's talking about that change, that transformation. He's talking about no, 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 being sanctified, being set apart in order for God to use you for his glory. I don't need to list the things that, 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 that we used to do because we know how we used to be. We know the life that we used to live, and we say, thank God for the change. Someone else will say, well, listen, I was a good person. I never did anything bad. Well, uh, uh, God bless you, but you still needed to be changed because the heart was messed up. But thank God for the new heart. Amen? Amen. The next verse, my brother, praise God. He says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. Now, when you become transformed, or when you become a believer, or when you become a child of God, your life takes on different meaning, different purpose. You are a different individual. And so God expects us to live according to his will and according to his word. And so he's saying, there has to be a change. Amen. Amen. There has to be a change. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. And I, I, I want you to understand that he wasn't just talking, speaking to the church in Rome, but he was speaking to believers in Corinth and in Thessalonica. He says, Know ye not that there is which that they which run in a race run all but one receive at the prize so run that you might obtain run that you might win and he's likened the Christian journey to a race because at the end of our Christian journey there are rewards awaiting us there are prizes awaiting us the Bible talks about crowns am I right? So there are rewards, and he said that when in a race, one person wins. But guess what? All of us can win. Amen. All of us can run this race, and all of us can be victorious. Because there's a prize awaiting each and every one of us. And so when you run, your, your, your mind ought to be focused on the prize that is awaiting us. Now while you are in this race, there are hurdles. There are hills to, over, to overcome. There are challenges. We don't know where they are, but they'll just pop up in the race. But we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we can win the race. Amen. Every man that striveth for mastery, every man that striveth for excellence is temperate in all things. If you are going to, if there's something that you have to achieve, some, some, some state of excellence, if it's a degree, yes, if it's a, a profession, whatever it is, whatever it is that you are working towards, there has to be temperance. And temperance means there has to be self-control. In other words, if you, are go, if you are going to college and you want to graduate, magna cum laude, is that the highest one? then you have to work towards it. You don't just sit down and wish. Oh, glory to God. 
Yeah, there is magna cum laude, and there is summa cum laude, and then and there is thank you, Lordy. <laughs> Glory to God. But, but, but whatever it is that you're working towards, you have to put some effort into it. And so Paul says, whomever is striving for excellence, for mastery, there has to be some temperance, some self-control, some restraints that you have to put on yourself. There are some things that you would love to do, but because it's going to hinder your progress, you deny yourself those pleasures because there is a goal in mind. And so Paul is saying, if we do this for earthly things, what about our heavenly reward? What about the crowns that are awaiting us? They do it, do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Because all those degrees and all those letters behind your name, after you leave this life, that's it. Oh, but the rewards that are in Jesus Christ, they have eternal value. They carry eternal weight. And so he's saying that if we work for the temporal so hard, then when it comes to our spiritual gain, we need to put some seriousness into it. We need to put our bodies under subjection. We need to present our bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. Amen? Amen? Reasonable service. And then he said, be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there's a connection between the soul and the body, and now we're going to talk about the mind. There's a connection between the body, the soul, and the mind. And so he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does your mind get renewed? Your mind gets renewed by the word of God. Are you with me? You see, we go to school to get informed. They send you to prison to get reformed. You come to God to be transformed. And God has the power to transform you and to make you who he wants you to be. And when we talk about transform, we're talking about a total change. Are you with me? When he went to the, the wedding at Canaan, the first miracle that Jesus performed, they gave him, and the Bible said, and he's such an awesome God. He went to the wedding because Jesus is interested. He's concerned about the small man, the common man. This was a, a, an obscure Jewish village where this wedding was, and Jesus showed up. And he showed up, and he saved. But the Bible doesn't tell us who the bridegroom or who the bride is, but, but, but the Bible, John tells us that Jesus was there. And he was there for a purpose. Amen. He saved the groom a great deal of embarrassment. Yeah. Because when he went there, the wine ran out. Yeah. And when the wine ran out at your wedding, it means that you didn't plan properly. Yeah. Or you didn't have enough money to buy enough wine to feed your guests. Yeah. But Jesus went there, and what he did was he transformed. Yeah. He transformed somebody, yeah. the water into wine. He made a change. Yes. And it's interesting how God wants to transform us. He wants to change our lives. Yes. And the interesting thing is that when he went, they gave him six jars, yes. six water pots. Yes? Now, did they need that, those six water pots for the wedding? No, that was above and beyond. But Jesus was looking at the needs of this couple. And he said, you know, how enough money to buy wine for the wedding? How are they going to survive their, 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 their marriage? And so he gave them enough wine to serve at the feast and to sell the rest to carry. Oh, glory to God. So when Jesus enters into your situation and he begins to transform you, he's changing you for a purpose. He's changing you for the long term. 
He's changing you because he looks ahead and he sees what your destiny is. And he says, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to make a new creature out of you. I'm going to show you what it means to have abundant life. What it means to have joy in your life. What it means to have peace in your life. What it means to have satisfaction. And that's what Jesus does. He changes your circumstances. He changes your thinking. And so he said to the church, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, we live in a corrupt society. People always complain about the world is and the world is. What more do we expect? The world is not changed. The world has been stained with sin. And so we have to expect that sin will exist around us. The Bible says in these last days, perilous times shall come. And he says, because he says, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. Which means that as we get closer to the end of time, we're gonna see more evil. So if you think it's gonna get better, think again, because it's gonna get worse. We're gonna have more evil sometimes than good. Because evil men and seducers are waxing worse. And so this is why he said in 1 John 2, 15, he says to his believers, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Because if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Praise God. And it is interesting to know that we have to be so careful. We have to be so careful that we don't get caught up in the world. We have to make a conscious effort. And then somebody will say, but pastor, we live in the world. How can we avoid the world or the things of the world? Well, guess what? This, the world has a system. The world has a way of doing things. The world loves those who love them in return. But when, we, when it comes to the people of God, we love those who hate us. We love those who want to do us bad things. We, we have to learn to love our enemies. Amen. We have to love those that despitefully use us. The ones that persecute us, they, those are the ones that we were called to love. Yeah. And thanks be to God, he has given us what it takes to love the unlovable. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, Loving the unlovable. Yeah, the Paul says such were some of us. Yeah. Because at one time, we were unlovable. Yeah. But thanks be to God. The love of God came into our hearts. Amen. 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 And because of the love of God, we are now transformed. Yes. So Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, is saying that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind, our thinking, has to be changed. And that transformation will only come through the word of God. Psychologists can't do it. It's the word of God. Psychotherapists can't do it. It's the word of God. Psychopharmacology can't do it. It's the word of God. Drugs can't do it. They tell you if you take a marijuana touch, it makes you feel better. But then it wears off. And you're back to square one. As a matter of fact, you're back to minus square one. Because sometimes you're worse than you were before when you take that first touch. But the answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. And so Paul says, we have to have our mind renewed. And to be of our mind to be renewed, we got to take a daily dose of the word of God. Amen. If we have a headache, we take Tylenol every four hours. Amen. How much of the word of God are we taking in? Sometimes we take a dose today. Maybe next week we take a dose. <laughs> Amen. But we got to get the right dose. Because we need the word of God. And so the mind has to be changed. And Paul, and in Philippians 2, the Bible says we, we have to let this mind of Christ, let the mind of Christ be in you. Let the mind that was in Christ 
be in you. Yeah. What was the mind of Christ? He was willing to despise the cross, the shame, because of what was ahead of him. You see, there are some things that we, that we are faced with that are troubling to us now, but we're going to have to go through them. And in order for us to go through them, we have to begin to look beyond the trial. We have to begin to look beyond the test. We have to begin to look beyond the crisis. Look beyond what it is that is causing us to stumble now. And, and, and the Bible says the joy that was set before him allowed him to despise the cross, to endure the shame. That was the mindset that he has. You see, the problems that we face, the solution, half of the solution is our attitude. If you look at the problem and you begin to tell yourself, that there is no way I'm going to come out of this, then you already failed. Yeah. But you have to begin to think positively and know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So your attitude, firstly, has to change. And then when your way of thinking begins to change, then your, the way you, you, you face the situation has to change. Because your mindset is already changed. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. I've met people who are not even Christians and they tell you some battles that they have fought because their will was so resolute, their mind was so made up that it didn't matter what their obstacles were, they were going to get to their destiny. And so if we are the church, we have the power of God in us, then our mind got to be made up. Somebody's got my mind made up. And I won't turn back because I'm going to see my Jesus someday. You see, my mind's made up. And I won't turn back because I'm going to see Jesus someday. If you don't have that mindset, you're going to turn back. Because you better believe that things will happen that will want to cause you to turn back. And it's not just in the world. Sometimes in the body of Christ. Things will happen that will cause you to turn back. But keep pressing forward. Greater is he that is in you. Then we come to the will. And listen to what Paul says. He says, he said about the will. And this, this is so important to us. In Romans 12 and, and in the second verse. He says, renew in your mind that he may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That means when you present your body and your mind is renewed, then the life that you live will show forth the will of God. In other words, this is not to test God's will, but this is to put God's will on display. When we submit ourselves and we live the way God calls us to live, then the very life that we live will demonstrate God's will to people who are around us. So they can see the power of God in our lives. Because when people see us, they ought to see Christ in us. You don't have to be in a suit to be a Christian. You don't have to have on a church looking dress. Well, we don't even know what I look like anymore. Because the dress is changed. But anyway, but let's move on. When it comes to the believer, Everywhere you go, the image of Christ, come on, thank you, Pastor Police, ought to be seen in your life. And especially when you are under persecution. Because that's when that's when the flesh has the greatest tendency to show up. When the pressure is turned on. Mm, man, I heard a pastor one day was faced with a conflict. And he said, listen, I'll put down the Bible and fight you. <laughs> and of course, I can imagine that was a test. But that thought should have been rejected. Because <laughs> the enemy will come in and try to disrupt your thinking. Sometimes you're having a good day. And all of a sudden, 
something happens to change your whole rhythm and throw you off your game. But we have to have our mind so renewed that we can do what God has called us to do. So what's the application to all of this? Well, when we got represented our body, know that we have come to God and said, God, here I am, use me. Then God can fill you up with his spirit. Are you with me? Okay. In, in, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, there was a prophet by the name of Isaiah who was very, 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 he was very moved by King Uzziah and the, very, and the, things, the many things that King Uzziah did. So much so that his, uh, his focus was on Uzziah. One day he met God. And when he saw God for who he is, he said, he saw God in the temple. And he says, he's high. And lifted up. Isaiah 6. And his train filled the temple. Isaiah saw God for who God really is. It changed his thinking. He said, God, I see you high and lifted up. The man the man was a prophet. He said, but I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm around people who are unclean. And then God sent an angel with a coal to try light to the dead coal. Thank you, sister. And put on his lips. Amen. Don't try it at home. But the, 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 the life coal on the lips symbolizes the transformation that comes from Jesus. The, the life call, the fire, signifies the transforming power of the word of God. And when he was transformed, the voice from heaven said, whom will I send? And the man of God said, here I am, Lord, send me. He said, here I am, because now he was transformed. The man was ready for God to use him. If you want God to use you, present your body to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, so God can give you the gifts of the church. He talks about the gifts of prophecy, the gifts of ministry. Who am I talking to the church? There are many gifts that were assigned to the body of Christ. But Paul is saying, in order for you to occupy your spot, you've got to give God your own. You have to allow God full access to all of you. Do you know that when you don't give God your all, you're denying him access to parts of you. And you're telling God, God, you can use this part. But this part is for something else. But, but God, he told, he looked at Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, before you were formed, in your mother's womb, I knew you. He says, I'm calling you and I'm going to send you. Yes, Jeremiah said, but God, I, I, I'm a young man. I can't speak. But when God touched him, yes. hallelujah, the man was ready to go. Yes. And let me tell you something. These two men, these two prophets, they had many opposition. But because they yielded themselves to God, God stood with them. The fact that they yielded themselves to God didn't mean that the enemy didn't oppose them, but God allowed them to come out on top. God allowed them to be victorious. What am I saying today? Church, Jesus is coming. Christ says, when I come, will I find faith in the earth? Am I going to find believers who are holding on to my unchanging hands? God wants us to be ready for him. And the only way to be ready is our body, soul, and spirit have to be yielded to God. So that when he comes for that marriage supper, we can all rise to meet him. Church, that marriage supper is a reality. The first miracle that Jesus performed was at a wedding. The wedding in Canaan. It, it was just that wedding, but he was showing, oh hallelujah, that he sanctifies marriage. That's one. Two, he was talking, he was pointing to the marriage supper that will be between him and his church. And we are going to be a part of that marriage supper. But we have got to be ready. The bride, the bride has to be ready. The bride has to be watching and waiting. 
The bride has to have her lamb trimmed. Yeah. The yeah. bride has to have on the right garment. Yeah. Because if you show up on the wedding with the wrong garment, yeah. you have a lamb to be thrown out. Yeah. But the bride has made herself ready. Yeah. The church yeah. is ready for Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. If not, the church will be ready. Because the Bible never talks about tomorrow. He says today. Yeah. So the church is ready. The church is waiting. The church is at the place where Jesus, when, when he comes, we can say, yes, Lord. And not even say, yes, Lord, because there won't be a question waiting for a response. But the Bible says the trump of God shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the ear. Be ready. For in such an hour, when we think not, our King Jesus. This morning we're singing, Jehovah, you, I trust. You trust in him? He's coming back for the church. Be ready. Because we don't know the minute or the hour. God bless you. May God keep you. Will you stand to your feet? Hallelujah. Come on and give God a Hallelujah. Now we can do better than that. enter password 3333 for all Zoom sessions. And of course, if you are physically unable to join us, we live stream every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. 
here on Facebook or EmmanuelHouseOfPrayer.org forward slash stay connected. If you are in need of prayer or searching for a church home, we here at Emmanuel House of Prayer will love to pray for you and will welcome you with open arms. Join us on our website, EmmanuelHouseOfPrayer.org forward slash contact us. You can always visit our website, Facebook page, or Instagram for weekly church announcements, such as our weekly food distribution dates and other community news. And lastly, your tithes and offering can be mailed to the church at 2820 Northwest 7th Court, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33311. God bless you all. Stay safe and stay connected.